sacred music. The very word music in itself would suggest an understanding of the concept it encapsulates on the part, that is, of those who coined it in the days of the early Greek civilization. For the word simply means the art of the muses, musicae techne. The concept of muse exists in other cultures. Indeed, a particularly well-read Welsh scholar, John Emir, has made an interesting study of its nature, interviewing a number of Welsh poets to ascertain whether they regarded the Awen, muse, as a real force or simply as a natural endowment. Many would reply with a compromise, suggesting that at certain points of high poetic transport, a line actually came to them. One would have loved to ask other members of the human race, who genuinely added to its heritage, whether they at times felt something greater than themselves, nudging them to try one particular combination of notes or words. The particularly prolific output of the Lennon-McCartney team in its early period would be one example that would merit a detailed study. For when compared with more recent modern work, it still has a resonance in the heart of the young that despite all the advances in technology, modern composers have not managed to reproduce. Likewise, the ability of a Keats or a Shakespeare to find the perfect word at the perfect time is something which few on earth will ever hope to retrieve. Hence it is that time itself sifts well those who merit a place in its revisited archives. We are the generation who stand on the bridge between civilizations. Before the publication of the first conciliar document, Sacro Sactum Concilium, in 1963, the specific domain of sacred music was governed by strict norms and parameters. The opening of many new avenues of composition and experimentation was a kairos, in which huge possibilities of enrichment and renewal came into view. Here, as elsewhere, time will do its sifting. However, one important instruction was almost entirely overlooked, namely that the Gregorian remained the natural expression of the praise and prayer of the Church in the West. It is true that the official settings for certain parts of the Mass to this day still return to the Gregorian for the basic inspiration, in the case of the dialogue and the preface. But it is equally true that the proportion of such material is minute when compared with the prevalence of very different modes and styles of liturgical melodies generally in vogue. In itself, this need not be a disaster, as it means that there has been genuine encouragement for local genius and expression of praise. The problem, however, lies 
in the distinction that needs at times to be made between what is intended to serve and honour and what is intended to be served and honoured. For praise that draws attention to itself is a usurpation of the throne. And beatified noise is pushing out of the silent king. Hence it is that, as in the case of the acquisition of the Ars Celebrandi, that art of celebrating so dear to the heart of Benedict the Sixteenth, in which a good celebrant is an interiorized celebrant, who has breathed the calm of the centuries that he has inherited. So too, the natural interpreter of oral praise is the one for whom it is the natural expression. Praise is not received by the one being praised in a way that is offensive to his ears. Nor is it accepted from the one who is not praising him on the level of the will. As in the case of the celebrant who offends in the very act of celebrating in flagrant disobedience to the will of the king, explicitly made known by his word to him in the rubrics. So too, in the case of the deliberately shocking emitter of disobedient noise, ignorant of the spirit of Sacro Sanctum Concilium, the praise deflected from its divine object remains sacrilegiously man-centred and merit-deflated with regard to its place in the life of the gathered community. The document in question reminds that community that its earthly liturgy echoes that of the angelic choirs. And one wonders how often the cherubim and the seraphim feel the need to add the incense of rhythmic claps to the thud of block-busting heavy voltage lyres. As in many things liturgical, we can profit from a step into an eastern cloud. Three hours later, one will re-emerge, a trifle pacified. Calm is the point of contact. And the noisy westerner is little aware of his handicap when it comes to the contemplative encounter. This encounter is not measured in seconds, with a 30-minute max, and even less in decibels, with an obligatory beat, ritually clapped, but in otherness. And more of the same thing is all that the Western genius seems able to produce for the author of Aeonic Beauty. We are talking about more of McDonald's. The rhythm keeps the liturgy going. So, in the liturgy, we are still kept going. And so, on our weekly step outside time, we are still kept going. We 
are engaging the youth. And we are bringing them on board. And so we have kept going like the youth into a very aged overkill of the once new and already hugely hackneyed. It is thought that the youth can respond only to what it knows. The truth, however, seems to be somewhat more nuanced. Our abbey in Tuscany was like a mini Teze. Many hundreds of young people would camp under our wings. Few were the young ones who were not moved by the experience, yes, experience, of organ, incense, Gregorian, and polyphony. Why? Because the human soul has the same structure from one generation to the next. And the authors of genuine beauty in one generation still pull at something in the depths of the easily moved young heart. Praise has a double role. It honours and it also elevates. Shallow praise elevates very little and cheap praise honours no one. Least of all the author of the music of the sphere. In living liturgy, it is not necessarily a question of either or, or all or nothing. One of the most moving recordings that one can hear on YouTube is that of the singing of angels during the celebration of Mass by the by now deceased Father Matteo Lagrua a charismatic exorcist in Sicily, whose cause for beatification has been introduced. It seems that the angels themselves are by no means closed-minded, but that they join in willingly wherever they encounter expressions of genuine praise in the heart. But that is the question. Is the heart involved? If so, the rest will spontaneously and authentically follow. If it is not, the rest will be both subject and object of yet more usurpation of the throne of the thrice holy Lord who was, who is and who is to come to come one day to put an end to many decibels which obliged the cherubim and seraphim to ask for leave of absence from our local Sunday Mass.
sentiamo la voce di padre Matteo Questa è una cosa incredibile. 